All right. So we're going to cover, generally speaking, these four areas on the exam, right? The exams, chapter three, chapter six, seven, and eight. So that's job costing, um, cost behaviors, short-term business decisions, and the cost volume profit analysis. This deck is on Canvas under online learning content. So you can also get the information there. Um, so one thing that you want to be comfortable with is understanding the flow of inventory. Okay? And it all starts with the purchase of the uh, raw materials, right? So the company first purchases all of its raw, purchases raw materials. Um, the company is also paying its employees. Um, the company is uh, using materials. Company is overhead costs. They're allocating the overhead costs, finished products, and then they sell the products. So if we were to look at that in the context of a journal entry, uh, let's go to the next slide first. So you, um, remember there's three different types of inventory, right? So you have raw materials inventory, work in process, and finished goods inventory. And then once it's sold, it moves over into the cost of goods sold. So if I could just go back to this slide here, um, and let me do a different chair. I'm gonna try and do something, and I hope it works. All right, so it starts when we purchase raw materials, right? So you got your raw materials inventory right here, right? So when you're purchasing the raw materials, that's going to be a debit to your raw materials. And then we'd probably credit something like accounts payable. Actually, can I, I should probably use some dollar amounts. You might want to throw out a dollar amount. How much raw material did we buy? 2000 2000 Then the next thing is that we're paying our employees. When we pay employees, that when we're paying employees direct, well, there's two things well, I should say. So, we have direct labor and we also have indirect labor, right? So let's pay our employees and we'll pay them in cash and let's pay them $600. So if it's direct labor, we're debiting our work in process. This is for the direct labor. Okay, and let's, let's assume that's 400. When it's indirect labor, it goes to overhead, indirect labor. So that's 200. So we'd have uh, 400 here, and our overhead is 200. And then somewhere over here would be crediting cash. We have some number here, obviously, because we can't credit it for 600. When we use materials, right? And so again, there's direct materials and there's indirect materials. Let's say that we use a thousand dollars worth of materials. So that's going to be a credit to our raw materials inventory. But if it's uh, direct materials that goes to our work in process, let's say that was uh, 800. Okay. And any indirect materials goes into overhead. So we'd have uh, 800 being added here, another 200 being added here, okay, and $1,000 being deducted from our raw material inventory. 
Are you guys following along? Mm. Okay. Yes, we do. Thumbs up. <laughs> the other type of overhead that you incur would be things like depreciation, insurance, um, just the other stuff, right? So whatever that other stuff is, let's just uh, let's just talk about accumulated uh, depreciation. We credit accumulated depreciation, debit overhead. Okay. Uh, well, let's do one more. Let's also do um, no, just cash for like uh, insurance, security guard, whatever else. Well, security guard would actually be indirect uh, labor. Whatever other insurance, anything else that we have. So let's say that's another 400. Let's say that's 100 and 300 more in cash. So when we incur it, that goes here, right? And then the offsets show up here. <clears throat> now, this is the one that I want you guys to be um, mindful of. And that is when we have, um, when we allocate our, <laughs> we're allocating overhead, the journal entry is a debit to work in the process and a credit to the overhead account. Okay. So let's assume that we allocated uh, $750. So that would be 750 here, adding 750 here. Can you give like a quick situation where that would happen, the work in progress and overhead? Is that like? Yeah, I think that's coming up in two slides. Okay, thanks. So it's the, but I'll, I'll brief it now. It's when it's with the four steps. So we have to estimate our total overhead, pick a, a select the cost driver, estimate our cost driver, come up with our predetermined manufacturing overhead rate, those three steps. And then step four is this right here. So every time we have a, uh, we incur an, a machine hour or a direct labor hour or a direct labor dollar, then we're allocating a portion of overhead to our products. Okay. So the last step is when we finish the products, right? So as we finish the products, we're using red, weren't we? When we finish the products, then we have our finished goods. And let's assume that we finished a thousand dollars worth of products. So as the products are being finished, we debit our finished. Oh, I'm not gonna let me write down there. We debit our finished goods, and we credit the process, moving it out of one account and moving it into the finished goods account. And then the last step is when we actually sell the products. Don't know where I'm going to write this at. When we sell the products, we're recording accounts receivable and revenue. And then we're also recording our cost of goods sold, crediting finished goods, right? When we credit the asset, it makes the asset go down. Let's assume we sold $700 worth of uh, finished goods. Okay. Seven. Um, and if we sold seven, if it cost us seven hundred dollars, how much did we sell it for? As much as we can sell it for. No, thank you, Adam. As much as we can. Which. I have a question. Be it, um, the cash is not debited. It could, if we if we sold it for cash, it'd be it would be a debit to cash. If we sold it on account, it'd be a 
debit to accounts receivable. How much did we sell this for? 4,000. 4,000? <laughs> <laughs> must be selling toilet paper. <laughs> nice gouging, okay. We sold it for more than, hopefully we sold it for more than seven. If not, uh, in the wrong business. <clears throat> I want to point your attention to, because you'll see this on the next slide, right? There's three different inventory accounts. This is the inventory account, raw materials. This is an inventory account, working process. This is an inventory account, uh, overhead. Okay. Those are all inventory accounts. I'm sorry, there's four inventory accounts. Uh, no, okay, let me back up. Uh, there's raw materials, there's work in process. The third inventory account is finished goods. Because when we get to the end, we're gonna look at whatever difference we have here and we're either gonna move it into, uh, we'll talk about this a little bit later, either back in the whip or move some of it into finished goods or move some of it into our, where's our cost of goods sold? Oh, here it is. You guys just couldn't see it. Or into our cost of goods sold. Questions on the flow of inventory. So manufacturing overhead, remember, we, and we saw that here. There's uh, three things that go into WIP. And that's going to be, I'm sorry, scratch that. Three things that go, yep, three things that go into WIP. Okay. Our indirect, nope, scratch that, sorry. Three things that go into our manufacturing overhead are indirect materials, uh, is, where'd you go, right here. Okay. Our indirect labor, which is right here. Okay, so indirect materials, indirect labor, and all of our other costs as well. All that goes into overhead. What's going into WIP is this step right here. Change colors. So this was Alyssa's question, um, where we do the four-step process, right? So this is how we allocate manufacturing overhead. It's going to be an estimate. First of all, we estimate what's our total overhead cost going to be for the, probably for the month, maybe for the quarter, maybe for the year, right? We estimate out what it's gonna be for a, a period of time. The next thing we do is we select some sort of allocation base, okay? whether that's uh, direct labor hours, it can be machine hours, it can be direct labor dollars, Whatever it is that we think is driving this cost, our indirect materials, our indirect labor, uh, and all of our other manufacturing costs. We're gonna pick, up, pick one of these, and then we're gonna estimate what do we think in that same period of time it's going to take for us to um, complete our production. And then that's step two. Step three is we calculate our predetermined manufacturing overhead rate. <laughs> the PMOH is the estimated overhead divided by the estimated 
driver, whatever that driver is, let's just say hours. That's going to give us a, a factor, right? $2.50 or something. It's going to be that $2.50 then that gets multiplied by the actual direct labor hours or the actual machine hours or the actual direct labor dollars. So every time we have a, let's just say direct labor hour, every time we have a direct labor hour, we're going to multiply that by $2.50. And then that's going to be a debit to work in process, a credit to manufacturing overhead. So this is where the under and over allocating came in? Um, that's coming next. Or was that later on? I can't remember what chapter that was from. That's, yeah, that's in definitely, that's in chapter three. How are we feeling? I feel like I have some reviewing to do, but besides- Me too. <laughs> I thought I knew what I was doing and now I'm a little bit, but that's okay. It's been a week off of not studying, so. Looking at it. So this is where we where where we are now. The um, actually pause. I didn't even acknowledge what you all just said. Yeah, you should study for this. Okay, I don't expect you all to just know this off the you know top of your head. Um. So um, this is what Alyssa was saying with the over allocate or under allocate. So what we're doing is we're looking at our manufacturing overhead account, right? And remember, what we've been putting in there has been this stuff, indirect materials, indirect labor, other stuff, right, from this thing right here. So indirect materials, 200, indirect labor, 200, other stuff, 400. And then what we've been crediting to manufacturing overhead has been whatever that predetermined manufacturing overhead rate is times our actual production. So in this case, it was uh, 750. So we take out 750, that's our credit to manufacturing overhead. So do we, are we in a situation where we over allocated manufacturing overhead or we under allocated manufacturing overhead? Green was not a good choice color, was it? See people kind of stare. I can kind of see it. So which side is the actual compared to like the estimate is that the correct? debit side right so the debit is the actual okay so we under allocated under allocated then by fifty dollars we under allocated by fifty dollars because we actually spent eight hundred dollars right on mm -hmm. indirect materials, indirect labor, um, other stuff. But we only applied $750 to our actual products. And for the test, the over or under allocation is always going to be not very significant, not significant, not significant. When the over or under allocation is not significant, our goal is just to get this account to be zero. Okay. So here we're going to credit our manufacturing overhead. Let's pick a different color. Credit our manufacturing overhead $50. 
so that this can be zero. And the debit or the other side of that journal entry is always going to be cost of goods sold. So the other side of our journal entry is always going to be cost of goods sold when we're dealing with the over or under allocation of manufacturing overhead. Questions? Under allocated. So you said, sorry, ask that question again. In that exact. In that example, we under allocated, just to make sure. Yes. 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 All right. Fancy the slides. To our next thing. So that's chapter three. Let's move to chapter six, which is cost behaviors, which is uh, a lot of it's a review from, uh, I believe, chapter two. When we were talking about fixed and uh, variable costs. Um, <clears throat> so the variable costs are those costs that uh, change in direct direct proportion to a change in volume. So what we mean by variable cost is the more something gets used, the more it's going to cost you, right? So it's a, um, it's tied to a ver to a specific activity and every, as that activity increases, it costs you more money. Um, a, 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 a good example, um, I hate to admit this, but you guys know I'm very honest. Um, we've been eating out a lot. Uh, and it's really more like an excuse to get out the house. Um, but, you know, we also say, oh, it's to help the local economy because the restaurants need our business. Um, so as you think about restaurants, right, and how they're struggling now because they have um, the variable cost would be, you know, if we go in and say, hey, we want to order a pizza, well, then the ingredients are the variable cost. Every person that orders a pizza is increasing their, um, increasing their ingredients cost, okay? which I'm sure they don't mind because they also have fixed costs, right? So in this um, fixed cost is going to be the rent, right? The rent is going to be the same whether they sell one pizza or 500 pizzas, right? Whether they have people sitting in the, whether people are eating for takeout or for takeout or, you know, whether people used to eat inside the restaurant. So that fixed costs are those costs that are going to remain constant over a uh, range of volume, right? So the local pizza shop can't sell a million pizzas in a month, right? They, they just don't have the bandwidth to do that. Um, but they definitely can sell 500 pizzas a day, right? But they're probably only selling about a hundred pizzas a day, right? So you, they've got to, um, manage those, uh, fixed costs. The new one that we talked about in chapter six is a mixed cost. And the mixed costs are those costs that have elements of both variable and fixed costs. Okay? Um, which means like, uh, I think some good examples, the examples that we used in class were um, utilities. There's a set amount that you have to pay no matter what, and then it's gonna go up depending on um, how, much, uh, how much electricity, how much gas you're using, right? That'd be an example of a uh, fixed cost. So for a lot of these restaurants who are now closing at seven o'clock or, um, you know, their, uh, their utility cost is going down. They still have utility costs. It's still somewhat a function of how many customers they get, 
but there's always going to be that baseline amount that they have to pay. All that is important because uh, it helps us with doing this analysis to figure out what's our cost per unit. And this is an example that we did with, I believe it was with pizzas. Um, we were looking at what's the variable cost per unit. You multiply that by the number of units produced. You add that to your fixed cost, and that's going to equal your uh, total cost. And then those total costs get divided by the number of units produced to get you to your um, cost per unit. I'm going to backtrack just a little bit because back to this mixed cost. Um, we talked about how to figure out how it's, when you're looking at a cost, and the costs are actually mixed costs. You want to be able to take that cost and find what's the fixed component and the variable component. This is all kind of leading us up to chapter seven when we do our cost volume profit analysis. And we have to be able to, to classify costs as either fixed or variable. I said, I'm telling you that to say that is not going to be on the exam is breaking up a mixed cost between fixed and variable that X, Y plotting rise over run. Okay. God, I thought somebody was going to throw confetti at that point. <laughs> All right. Moving on. Moving on. I have a high, you know, I just keep high standards, high expectations. Mirror a little bit. <clears throat> so if we assume our variable cost per unit is, let's say it was $3. And let's assume that we produced a um, thousand units. Okay? And then let's assume our fixed costs are uh, $800. Our total cost would be this $3 times the 1,000 units produced plus the 800, which is 3,800. Then we divide that by the number of units that we produced, right? So the same number that's right here, 1,000. 38,000 divided by 1,000 is $3. 80 cents. I also should say, say this, this exam is um, math heavy. Um, a lot of this like uh, algebra. I don't want, I was gonna say basic algebra, but I don't think there's such thing as basic algebra. Um, but we're multiplying and we're solving for numbers and a lot of that stuff, which a lot of which we really got into in chapter Chapter eight. Um, but I want I want you to see what this looks like if instead of producing a thousand units, let's say we produced uh, twelve hundred units, right? And so our fixed cost would still be eight hundred. Our variable cost per unit is still three dollars, right? But when we multiply three times twelve hundred, that gives us or plus 800, that is, I ain't gonna embarrass me. 44. 4,400. All right, I, just, I don't wanna be embarrassed, you know. 4,400. 440, yeah. Everyone, this is, as a CPA, this is my uh, go-to calculator. <laughs> Hire me. It's little, this is mine. <laughs> <laughs> and then here we produce 1200 units oh i don't know why i put that away 4400 divided by 1200 is three point 
$3.67. So just to double check, the 1200 is uh, us uh, trying another one. Is that what's going on right now? The 1200 is, say that again. 1200 is us doing another, uh, another example or? Yes, so let's assume that, that purple was January and red was February. Okay. So I, I, I do this to show you kind of the, the difference between um, this cost per unit. So if we produce a thousand, our cost per unit is $3.80. If we produce 1200, our cost per unit goes down $3.67. If we were to produce 1,500 units, would our cost per unit go up or down? Down. Down, right? And what's this is what's happening, right? This isn't changing our uh, variable cost. What's changing is this $800 of fixed cost. We're either going to spread that between thousand units or 1200 or 1500 okay, or God forbid 800 or 700 okay, whatever that relevant range is right so the more we can produce within our range the lower our cost per unit will be And all this leads us to this contribution margin statement. Um, well, what we're doing is we're looking at our sales, less our variable expenses to get our contribution margin, right? So your sales minus variable costs equals your contribution margin. Okay. And as we'll see when we get into chapter seven, like we do, we do an, an eight, we do a lot of fancy things with the uh, contribution margin. Um, then after we have our contribution, then we have our fixed costs below our variable. Okay. And this is not right. This is not your net income. This is your operating. But between now and Wednesday, we called it net income. It's not gonna matter. No. But so sales minus variable costs minus your fixed costs equals your operating income. Oh. Pausing for questions. So as I'm talking, I'm kind of realizing chapter three is kind of sort of a thing. I don't want to say it's a thing to itself, but it, it kind of, you know, it's a very specific skill set, like the allocating of overhead, all this stuff, but it's more on the financial accounting type side of things where six, seven, and eight all kind of build on one another, right? So if you feel comfortable with six, that gives you, um, some bravado moving into chapter seven. Forty four hundred. Thanks, Alyssa. Okay, uh, a long time ago. All right. I was just checking uh, what was in the chat. All right. Chapter seven, shall we move on? Yes. Cost volume profit analysis. This is where the plot thickens. So our contribution margin, right? And we can look at the contribution margin in total like we were doing on this right here. Oh, went too far, 8,900. Or we can look at it on a per unit basis, right? So for every 
burger that we sell, what does it cost us to make that burger? That's our contribution margin per unit. Or we can look at the sum of all the types of burgers that we sell um, and then come up with our contribution margin for that product. Or we can look at all the burgers and fries and uh, sodas that we sell and come up with our contribution margin for the, for the company. <clears throat> There's also- I'm sorry, anyone else's Zoom them off? Or is that just me? What was that? And anyone's what? Like my Zoom just like booted me off and then I just got back on. Anyway, that to be earlier. I hope it doesn't do that to me. That would be really awkward. We missed you. We missed you so much. Maybe it's my Wi Fi. I'm going to find a new place to like. Oh, this is what I want to say. Oh, there's also the weighted average contribution margin. Right. So you will be tested on. Um, that will be on the exam as well, the weighted average contribution margin. When you're looking at, I'm selling burgers, I'm selling fries, and then you're saying, what's the weighted average of that? So I look at the contribution margin and let's say I'm selling, I should probably, let me just switch. So I'm selling burgers and fries. Okay. And my contribution margin for every burger is $1.25. My contribution margin for every bag of fries I sell is 50 cents. Okay. But I look at, so that's my contribution margin, the burgers and fries. But then I want to look at what's my weighted average contribution margin, right? So I say for every two burgers that I sell, I sell one order of fries. Okay. So in that sense, my weighted average contribution margin would be two times 125, which is $2.50, okay. plus one times 50 cents, okay. which is $3. So when I sell three products, okay, um, I'm getting $3 in contribution margin. So my weighted average contribution margin would be three divided by three, $1. Okay. <clears throat> that's this leads us to uh, the in my opinion the creme de la creme of this class break even right, we're asking ourselves if this is the business model we're going to run right I'm sure so many restaurants are asking themselves this question right now what's the minimum amount of service revenue that we need to generate in order to break even so if we can't generate that much revenue, then we might as well just shut down because okay? it's not worth it. Or, and for them, maybe it's not even break even. It's uh, a target profit. I'm getting ahead of myself. Break even. So the break even analysis, you look at your fixed cost and you divide it by your unit contribution margin. Okay? This tells you how many you need to sell how many burgers how many fries we can also take our fixed costs and divide it by our contribution margin ratio which by the way I don't think I ex explained that contribution margin ratio is your uh, contribution margin this number here divided by your revenue this number here. Okay. 
So our contribution margin ratio, this will tell us how many dollars we need to sell. Okay. What do we need to sell? How much revenue do we need to generate in order to break even? All right, and I think I'll talk to myself because most companies don't want to just break even. They want to make some sort of profit. Um, and for a lot of these small business owners with these with the restaurants and whatever other small businesses they run, you know, they also need to be compensated for their time. Although they have a household and a family to support. Um, but we're looking at taking our fixed costs. And the only difference between target profit and break even is we're adding in trying to find a better color. We're adding in how much profit do you want to generate? Your goal is to generate $1,000 a month in target profit. Well, then this is the amount of you need to sell, okay? or this is the amount of revenue you need to generate in dollars in order to achieve whatever that target profit is. Is it the unit contribution margin or the contribution margin in general? Oh, well, thank you for asking. It's the unit contribution margin. Okay, and that's revenue minus variable costs for one unit. Yes, that's the revenue per unit minus the variable cost per unit. Okay, got it. For break even sales, are we going to be tested on break even mixed sales, or is it just going to be the straightforward break even units or dollar amount? I believe there is a break-even mixed, which is why we have the weighted average contribution margin. <clears throat> Other questions? Margin of safety, is that coming up or is that um, going to be in this oh, test? Uh, okay. <laughs> it's coming. I lost my little display. All right, here we are with the, uh, so we covered job costing, cost behavior, CVP analysis, short-term business decisions. This is the point in time when things got a little different for us because we did chapter eight all uh, on online. Um, so we talked about five, one, two, three, four, five different types of business decisions. Uh, special orders. Um, so when should a company accept a special order? Um, we talked about discontinuing products. When should a company just discontinue a product? Say, hey, you know what, let's not, um, this is a losing proposition for us. And let's, let's decide to no longer sell whatever product. <clears throat> Uh, outsourcing, at what point does it make sense for them to um, pay someone else to do the work for them? Um, and they're thinking about what their variable costs are, how much they'll save in their fixed costs. What's the optimal product mix? And so this is the example when we had to deal with a uh, constraints. So the constraints could be we can only manufacture so many products. We can only put so many products on the shelf or in our store. So how do we create the right product mix so that we're maximizing our uh, profitability? And the fifth one was whether or not we should sell, sell the product as is or do some further processing. Should we do more work? And really the question is 
more work, is the additional revenue going to outweigh the additional cost? I'll, I'll let you guys tell me if you have any questions about any of those uh, five. I have a question on optimal product max. Just so I don't remember. Okay. Could you please review that one? My internet connection is unstable. Let's see. Can you guys see me? Yes. Okay. Um, the question was on optimal product mix? Yes, please. Okay. Tell me more. Um, actually, I don't remember anything about that. Okay. <laughs> Neither do I. Um, yeah. Uh, I think that, yeah, someone help me out. I think that was when you um, were you deciding which product to make depending on how much revenue it, it generated. So if you had something that generated um, more revenue and less hours. Um, so if, I think you used Kylo and Boba Fett. If you could um, produce five Boba Fett and one Kylo Ren, but you only had so many hours um, with machine hours, then you would decide which one would produce the most. There's one on uh, my accounting lab because I was able to do the homework and it had to do with like different sized soda cans and the amount of space on the shelf. Right. Yeah. And it's like five spots per one linear foot for the 12 ounce and then four for 20 ounce ones per one linear foot. And based on like the contribution margin, like deciding which one you should like optimize to make the most profit. Right. Yep. Remember that one. Good memory. <laughs> I just did it today. So. Oh. <laughs> Uh, does that help, Zura? Um, yes, I get the idea. <laughs> does, that, does that help you remember kind of what your question was about those types of problems? Yeah, actually, I forgot anything. I don't remember anything about optimal product mix, but when um, these two people are uh, giving some information, I get the idea. Okay. So the, the good thing, so there's this positives to this, you guys. The good thing is with chapter eight is all those videos are still um, online. You can go back and look at the videos um, to kind of refresh your memory. And to the extent that you still have questions, we can answer them. <laughs> okay, sure. Um, so let's see here. Only other thing I was going to ask then is I remember in the videos you gave us like, oh, there's three questions you should ask yourself when making the decision. Do we need to know those questions like by heart? No. So th and thank you for reminding me. So on the exam, the only, so the only question that we're asking ourselves is, are we going to make more money doing this? Okay. So we don't care if we're ruining the planet or the community or customer service. Ah, are we going to make more money? If so, let's do it. I mean, it's actually, I, I'm joking. It's not a do it, should you do it or should you not do it. It's what's going to be the impact to your operating income if you do this or how much more income could you generate, right? So we're just focusing on the, um, the dollars and cents of the decision. All right, I see we have a new student, Hannah's dog. <laughs> Make sure uh, she has her, her 
login for my accounting lab, which by the way is working for me at least now. Um, all right, things fitting perfectly into other things. So this is other stuff, um, margin of safety. So that's when we're looking at um, how much did we sell? Are we planning to sell? And then what is our break even? Right, and the margin of safety is the difference between um, what our break even is, the minimum we need to sell in order to not lose money, and what we plan on selling. Um, <clears throat> any questions on that? No. And then you have the um, operating leverage. And this is when we're looking at our um, contribution margin divided by our operating income. And that's giving us a context of um, how much of our total costs are fixed versus how much of our total costs are variable. <clears throat> when a company has low variable costs, they have a higher operating leverage. Um, I think the example we talked about was a golf course. And um, I think golf courses are closed right now, uh, but I could be wrong. But uh, with golf course, right, they have these fixed costs that's just going to sit there, right? So um, the variable cost is less important, whereas a company like uh, Uber or Lyft, they have a much lower level of fixed cost. It's all variable cost. So the more revenue they generate, the more their uh, costs are going to be. And then the last uh, one is uh, sunk cost. And these are costs that are not relevant to the decision that you're making. Um, so when you're making a decision as to, should we purchase this new equipment? Um, an example of a sunk cost would be, well, what was the original purchase price of the equipment? that we, when I purchased it four years ago. That's irrelevant to the decision because you've already incurred that cost. Um, you wanna know things like, what's the new cost going to be? What is it gonna cost me to dispose of this equipment um, if I get rid of it? You're, just, you're factoring in the new cost, not necessarily the cost that you've already incurred. Um, I have a question. Uh, Yes. The sunk cost is uh, cost which is uh, incurred in the past, and it is relevant or ir irrelevant? Irrelevant. Not relevant. Yeah. Okay. Not. Um, All right. Let's see. What questions do you have? How many of you ever played uh, Connect One? No. No. How many of you ever played Connect Four? Oh, yeah. I have. <laughs> That's what we would have played if we were uh, uh, together, if the governor and the president allowed us to be together. Uh, so we're not going to play. Uh, we're not going to play that, but we are going to give you. An, I'm going to give you an opportunity for us to uh, do some. Um, oh, where'd you guys go? 
give you guys an opportunity for us to earn some extra credit and also to get a sense of the types of the way the questions are going to look on the exam. Um, so I'm proposing that we take a uh, 10 minute break. Uh, so for those of you who um, and those of you who do not want to come back, you do not have to come back. Um, those who do come back, what we're going to do is I'm going to um, put put you all into a breakout and then have you all work on, uh, I think it's 12 different problems. And I'll give you guys like 30 minutes to do that. And then we're going to come back together. And um, for the problems that you get correct, the more problems you get correct, the more extra credit you earn. But as a group, you all are going to work on this. Um, and then somehow, oh, I think I figured it out. I remember. Then I'm going to go into your breakout and have you guys tell me your 12 answers. A, B, C, D, A, B. Who's coming back in 10 minutes? Show of hands. Um, oh, with, the, with the reaction thing or a thumbs up. You know. Oh, is that the like, the little like yeah, thumbs up? Reaction. There's two reactions. Okay, I see. I, how, do, how, do I, how do I do the thumbs up? There's a reaction button. Click on this. Um, I need to check in on my family. They said my dog got out, so. Oh. I need it. Yeah, I see. I'm not quite sure at the there moment. There we go. So. All right. So before I we uh, part depart, oh, the, all these other people face I can't see. Hi, all y'all. Um, are there any other? Let me. Oh, let me. I was able to log in, so I have it set up to start at five o'clock on uh, tomorrow, and then it'll end at um, ten o'clock tomorrow. Tomorrow or Wednesday? Wednesday, right? Okay. Um, is that five hour window enough time for you to sit for um, oh it says we're performing to improve the product please try again later okay it's unavailable again um, is that enough time for you to sit down uninterrupted uh, for two hours and take the exam yeah yes so it so so it is timed Yes, so it is timed. So from the point we take it, we have two hours? From the point you start till you finish, you have two hours. Uh, okay. And then what I'm going to do um, is I'm going to Zoom at um, 5.30. And I'm going to stay in Zoom from 5.30 until 6.30. Okay. So if you have a question, you can log into Confer Zoom, ask me the question, and then log back out. If you don't have any questions, then you don't have to log in. If you're not planning to take the exam until, if not, you're not planning to start it until eight o'clock, I will probably not be available. Um, will, will you be available through email? Rob, I don't know. Probably not. You said 5.30 to 6? 5.30 to 6.30. Okay. Not Yeah, not at 8 o'clock starting time. I'm just meaning like throughout the day tomorrow. Oh, yeah. I'll be available. Yeah, I'll be available via email. Um, I'm also available for uh, office hours. Um, so if you want, we can do a, a Zoom meeting uh, or a phone call and kind of talk through any questions that you that you have. Okay. Um, I will tell you this, I, I think the, uh, what is this, the five to 750 class? Um, I do think the next uh, yeah. 30 minutes of you all um, kind of working on this, working on these problems in a small group, um, you know, in these breakout rooms. And I believe you guys can like create whiteboards. You guys can run on your whiteboards um, and kind of work on these problems together. I think that's gonna be extremely, extremely helpful um, for you. So I encourage you to, um, if you can, stick around so that, you know, you can like more opportunities to learn. At what time will the exam be available? Will it be, will it be available at five or will it be able before? It'll be available at five. Okay, so from five and if there's a 
five hour time frame. Yes. Right? Yes. Completed by ten. Perfect. So, so that means you don't want to start it later than eight. Right. <laughs> it should not take you two hours to complete the exam. Yeah. Um, I don't want to give you guys unlimited time and I don't want you to feel pressured. It's probably like an hour and 15 minute exam. Yeah, just like the regular exam that we have in class, like the time, regular time. Yep. And we use notes, <laughs> only our four by six card. I'm not going to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Some people are more ethical than others, and so I, I don't want to lead anyone down a, a pathway. Um, <laughs> you have two hours to complete the exam. Um, it's not possible for you to research every answer to to find it. Um, I do think that I do think that we, you all should um, exercise, you know, ethics. Um, but also think that you, so I think you should be reasonable in kind of the resources that you use. Do you get your score right away? Uh, I, I think it's, I think it's set up to give you the score like after the exam closes. Oh, okay. Uh, like a 10. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you get less up now? Like how many uh, version for each chapter? Uh, I, I don't know that information. Yeah, I don't know. But it's a good, it's a, it's a good mix. It's a pretty even mix, if I recall. Are we taking a 10 minute break right now? Oh, we're gonna take a 10 minute break right now. I will see you all in okay. 10 minutes. I think I'll be back now, so I'm good. Okay, so at 6.25. I'm going to see if I can't put on a uh, timer. There you go. Okay, so 10 minutes now. Let's go.
Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Thank you.
Oh my god, my dog keeps barking. Oh. Um.